Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. Today, Dr. Adam Kiefer is joining us from Mercer University, and he received his doctoral degree from the University of Illinois. He's been teaching at Mercer University for the past four years. He actually just received Vulcan's Innovation and Teaching Award, and he has a very interesting talk today. So he did run some research in Africa, southeastern Africa, Mozambique. They're measuring the levels of mercury pollution in these gold mining camps. So if you would, please give your attention to Dr. Kiefer. Thank you, Dr. Seb. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you guys today about something that is, is pretty non-traditional for undergraduates to take part in. Uh, I'm going to spend some time today talking to you about artisanal mining. Now, I'm a chemist by training, an organic chemist, as a matter of fact. So I'm actually operating outside my comfort zone. And that's OK in science. The key thing is to always admit when you don't know the answer, OK, um, and constantly keep learning. We took a group of students, actually two groups of students over the last two summers to Mozambique. Mozambique is a country um, in southeastern Africa. And we went to the, the uh, Sofala province and the Manica province, okay, specifically right about there, um, and to work with artisanal gold miners. Now, all of you guys, I guarantee you, all of you have gold on you right now. As a matter of fact, it's in your cell phones. Okay? Gold is necessary for so many things we do. Not just jewelry, okay, but electronics. 40% to 60% of the gold okay, that we have is based around artisanal gold miners, non-industrial gold miners. And so that's what I'm going to be concentrating today, specifically how the miners use mercury. So basically, for today's talk, I'm going to talk with you guys a little bit about the Mercer uh, and Mercer on Emission programs um, that, that we've operated through. And then we're going to talk about artisanal mining procedures, specifically as they relate to Mozambique. Artisanal mining takes place on every continent, OK? Um, and a lot of the techniques that are used are the same. In Mozambique, they're very rudimentary, OK? And they employ elemental mercury. And then I'm going to wrap up the talk uh, talking about some of our findings in three specific mines. Uh, the Munyena mine, uh, which we reevaluated from work done in 2006 by a different group. Uh, the Tsetsera uh, mine, which is a very informal mine, a very rough place to go. And then finally, we're going to end up talking about the Cleantech mine. As a matter of fact, a paper uh, that I wrote with another colleague and seven undergraduate co authors just got published um, in the Journal of Gleaner, uh, Cleaner Production uh, yesterday. Um, outlining uh, the work that's been done there, turning this into a mercury-free mine. So a little bit about Mercer. Uh, we got three campuses, Ma Macon, Atlanta, and Savannah. We have about 2,000 undergraduates, and that combines the College of Liberal Arts, which is where I teach, the business school, the engineering school, and the nursing school. And CLA has historically been the flagship program, but as many of you guys know, especially those of you um, interested in, in, in nursing and in pre-med, we do have Two schools of medicine, we just opened up a third campus in Columbus, a school of pharmacy, a school of business, a school of theology, a school of nursing, a school of engineering, a school of education, and a school of continuing education. So we're a very diverse group of faculty and students, okay, with many different interests. Okay? And here's the key thing. The program that I work through, Mercer on Mission, unites all of them. It's a service-oriented program that's all about taking people, taking students, and having them use the skills learned inside the classroom to help at least address some of the world's problems. Obviously, there's Macon. It's a white arrow, so it doesn't show up that well. But we have programs in Asia, Southeast Asia, um, medical programs here. We have uh, educational programs throughout Africa. There's Mozambique again. There's our program. Um, we work in orphanages in Eastern uh, Europe. Um, and then you have uh, South America programs and Central American programs that are interested in environmental policy and things of that nature. Okay? Again, the goal of the program is to take students from Macon, from Atlanta, from all throughout Georgia, and bring them to places that they've never heard of, to experience cultures that they've, they've never had an opportunity to experience. Okay? And it's service in many shapes and sciences. When, when I started two years ago, three years ago, um, we were the only science service program 
Uh, and now there's, there's another one that's operating in Trinidad and Tobago. This is what Mercer on Mission is not. It's not study abroad, okay? We go out and we do service. It's service-oriented learning. It's not two-dimensional, and what I mean by that is we view this as being a cultural immersion. That's half the battle, is getting our students to think and to experience things that other people from very different backgrounds experience and think about. And it's certainly not easy, okay? Traveling to Mozambique is very difficult. There's only one road that runs north-south throughout the entire country, and it's, on a good day, what I would call incomplete, okay? There are no paved roads. When rainy season happens and a bridge washes out, you know, it can take you two hours to drive five, ten kilometers, okay? This is very hard on the students, okay? But it's also very rewarding. Why would I choose Mozambique? And the answer is Mercury. Is there a way to shut off these front lights? It's going to be a picture intensive. I don't know how to do that. But um, Mercury, okay? Some of the highest levels of rural contamination of mercury in the world, okay? Remarkably high levels. Now, how many of you guys know a lot about mercury? It's something that everybody knows a little bit about. Where, where's a lot of the mercury we're exposed to come from in the United States? What's that? That's the big one. Okay, in the United States, it's predominantly in fish. Fish bioaccumulate organic mercury. Okay? Mercury is used, however, for many different things. It's in a lot of light bulbs these days. Okay? Um, it's also used in mining. So a little bit about where we go in particular. We go to the Manica province. It reminds you a lot of the Appalachians okay, through Virginia. Um, and it's in the Greenstone Belt, and these mountains are 3.2 billion years old. Okay, used to be covered by an inland sea. Absolutely fantastically beautiful. Okay, and this is the view from one of the most polluted mining camps that I've ever been in. Okay, it's absolutely stunning. But Mozambique is exceptionally poor. Okay. And this is actually a quote from this miner here whose name is Ishmael, um, who became good friends with one of our students while we were over there. And the program takes about three weeks. You get a chance to really start to meet and know people. Gold comes from heaven, but it's removed from hell. Okay? This is dirty, hard, hot, and exceptionally dangerous work. That piece of rock right there, I'll pass around. Every day, each individual miner, and you can see here, there's actually not a lot of gold in this rock, but there's a little bit. Um, each day, the miners get up about 6 o'clock in the morning, and they go into these crudely dug tunnels, um, and they harvest the rock, uh, 15 kilograms per person, and they go up and they, they work together to, to remove the rock from the side of the mountain. Okay. This is the mine at Setsera. You can see here, this is uh, Andrew Jones, um, who's one of my students, and this is me for reference. I'm about six and a half feet tall, and this is about a fifth of the, the, the depth of the mine here. And the way the miners do this is basically you see that there's these little steps here, and guys at the bottom take a shovel full of dirt and move it up to the next level. Then the next guy takes a shovel full of dirt and moves it up to the next level. Okay, and that's how my computer's low on memory. That's how uh, they get dirt from the bottom out, okay? Obviously, the dirt they're shoveling is not the rock. This entire process is there to get that rock out, and the gold is kind of trapped inside the rock. Okay, this actually says it's a pretty deep hole. Um, this is a mine called Clean Tech, okay? Unlike the previous mine, this mine, the miners go in and they're much more organized and they basically timber frame uh, the mine. Um, and so it's a lot more safer. They use air hammers, okay, to remove that, that rock, okay? So right off the bat, you have two different mines and two totally different ways to remove the rock. The one at Setsera is done totally by hand. This is what I would call an artisanal small scale mine, okay? They have a little bit of technology. They have generators to generate power, okay? And there are organized mines, okay? But they're few and far between. Would somebody want to comment about why they think that this picture that is very hard to see is so impressive? Do you think mining is a gender-specific industry in Africa? 
This is Kim Lammers, one of my students. She's the first female in the 25-year history of the mine to be allowed into the mine. Okay? These are things that, that we, we hope that the miners are also learning a little bit about our culture from us. She was the first person into the mine and the last one out. She didn't get stuck. She just liked it, I guess. Okay? These are also miners working at clean tech. Okay? So you get that rock out that's being passed around. Back to Setsera. So we get this rock. Okay. The gold's trapped inside it, and the first thing they do is they take mortar and pestles and they spend about 30 minutes taking their 15 kilograms of rock and turning them into basically gravel-sized chunks of rock, okay. busting it up. Then you'll see that that's actually part of a car. What they do is they take two sticks that are forked and they take, I think it's, it's like a gigantic uh, gas tank, and they basically weld a handle on and they toss stainless steel ball bearings in there and they grind it for an hour and each miner has their own style some guys will do one hand than the other but it takes about an hour and it grinds it down into a very very fine sand okay and so you can see the difference here here's the ground rock okay uh, from crushing it by hand this rock right here is um, basically when it's pulverized and it comes out as a very fine sand after crushing. That's when the mercury comes in. So the final step, the last 15 minutes when they're crushing it, they will take the universal measurement of mercury, okay, is a Coca-Cola bottle cap in the artisanal gold mining community. And they'll take one or two capfuls and they'll toss it in and they'll continue to grind that rock. And what's gonna happen is the mercury dissolves the gold. Okay? It forms an amalgam. If you have a dental filling, you have a silver amalgam okay, in your mouth. Silver and mercury mixed together. Okay? A gold amalgam is nothing more than gold that's dissolved in mercury. It's a solid. Okay? And what they do is they take the silt through the panning process. They take that mercury okay? and then that finely ground stone, they put it into a pan and they put water on top of it and they shake it around and the looser soil gets removed. The heavier gold and mercury sit at the bottom. Okay? What's one of the downsides about where do you guys think they get their water from to do this? You think they go to a faucet and turn it on? Probably not, right? There's no running water in these mining camps. There's no electricity. They do it right on a river okay, or a pit filled with water, rainwater. That mercury does end up going into the soil and into the water. They try to recover as much as they can, but nobody's 100% efficient. At the end, you're left with a puddle of mercury. Okay? And you can kind of see, if you've ever seen mercury, it's a liquid. You can kind of see how this looks a little bit rougher. Okay? The rough parts are the amalgam okay? that is dispersed through the liquid mercury. And you can see they're not using gloves here like we would do. Okay? They don't have access to gloves. Many of the people that we ran into don't know that mercury is dangerous. Okay? They know that it's a way to make their living, and they know that it's a way to feed their family. Thanks, man. Um, and so they're less concerned about chemical hygiene than we would be. This is nothing more than a very fine mesh t-shirt. And what they're going to do is they go ahead and they wring it out. So 15 kilograms of rock leaves you with an amalgam approximately this size. Nobody wants to buy amalgam. People want to buy gold. What do you guys think? How are we going to get rid of the mercury? What do you, what's that? Melt it. What they call burning. And basically they're going to heat it up enough that that mercury is going to become volatilized. Okay? And it's going to leave behind the gold. Remember, mercury is a liquid metal. Okay, you can heat it up at a reasonable temperature and blow that mercury right off, leaving behind gold. That's the amalgam that results in Mozambique from 15 kilograms of ore. Sometimes you'll see amalgams that are much larger. Okay, where does the mercury go next? What they do is they take that amalgam and they blow off the mercury by putting it on a burning log. Does anybody notice anything weird about this picture? Take a good look at the top of it. That's right. There's a leg there, and if you pan back out, what you'll see is they live, they sleep, they eat, they raise kids where they work with mercury. 
Elemental mercury, believe it or not, is not that bad in its liquid form. Don't do this, but when I was a little kid, I remember putting some in the palm of my hand and pushing it around. Okay, yeah, don't do that. Okay, one of the things that I would say, it becomes much more dangerous once it becomes heated. The reason being is you're taking a liquid with bulk material properties, okay, that don't allow for absorption into the human body, okay, and you're volatilizing it, and you're turning it into very small particles, and it's being breathed in, and it's basically going straight into your bloodstream. The burning is the most dangerous part, because when they burn it, that mercury's got to go somewhere, and they take the log and they blow on it, okay, and all the mercury vapor gets breathed in. Okay? This causes severe health problems. Okay? Basically a lot of neurological problems that result in something called mercury intoxication. Tremors, uncontrolled tremors, short-term memory loss, eventually long-term memory loss, slurred words. It actually, in some cases, when you meet somebody with mercury intoxication, it can come across like they've been drinking. Okay? But ultimately this can also result in death and it certainly does no benefits for the environment. So the question is, is what were we going to do about it? This is Kyle Blyton, and you'll see right here that this is our Lumex RA915 plus. I don't know why they threw the plus on there. It must be important though, okay? And this is an atomic absorption spectrometer. We, c we knew going in that we couldn't solve the problem. Mercury is cheap. It's readily available. People use it all over the world. However, we can tell the story and we can train miners how to use it safely. And that's what the rest of this story is going to be about. This instrument detects mercury down to five nanograms per cubic meter. So think about how big a cubic meter is. And then think about what five billionths of a gram is. This guy is very, very, very sensitive for detecting elemental mercury. And we brought it into mining camps um, to basically determine where this mercury was going and to show the miners firsthand that when they burn amalgam and they breathe it in, when they breathe it in this tube where it's supposed to be very, very low concentrations, it's supposed to be zero nanograms per cubic meter, some of them were blowing 60,000 nanograms per cubic meter. So you're dealing with a five order of magnitude increase, okay, in mercury and human breath as opposed to what's going to be there. Okay, so we use the Lumex, okay, and you can see that basically what we would do is we would have the miners breathe into the tubes and get real-time feedback. We also walked around the mining camp and found hot spots of mercury, okay? We mapped these with GPS locations. We took soil samples, okay? We also introduced, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but we also introduced miners to the concepts of retorts. Think back to organic chemistry. Anybody recognize this? What if this were a round bottom and there was a water line coming in here and leaving here? What does that look like to you guys? It's a distillation, and that's what a retort is, okay? This is constructed by discarded automobile parts. Um, and basic concept behind it, and I'm not going to unscrew it because it's very loud, but you basically put your amalgam there that they typically put on the log, and you put this end in the fire. And the mercury comes up, and this is a cooling jacket, and it collects the mercury on the other side, okay? This is a way to prevent exposure. We brought with us designs for retorts, and we shared them with a number of, of people who did kind of you know, this is one of their jobs, uh, fabrication. Okay, we, we gave them the plan so that miners can start using them. Okay, we also did psychological evaluations, which is not the way that it sounds. That's what it's called, but basically what this was was a questionnaire. We talked with the miners. Because sometimes when you're doing research and you're learning about other people, the most important thing you can do is shut up and listen. Okay, I mean, that was one of the most important things for us, was right here questionnaires, learning about where the miners came from, okay, learning about why they use mercury, learning about the food in their diet, okay, learning about all of these things that led up to higher mercury readings in their breath. And again, we took soil, water, and air samples as well everywhere we went. You can see that right here, this is where they're mining. Basically, this is all of the leftover silt, okay. It builds up. It gets very, very deep. Um, it's not exactly environmentally, it's not pretty, okay, in terms of the amount of metal and things of that nature that are in there. So, I told you guys we would come back to retorts. Um, one of the mines that we went to was the Munyena mine, okay, and the Munyena mine, uh, gold was discovered there in 1998, okay. 
Um, and in 1998, nobody was living there. And at, by the end of 1998, there was over 5,000 miners that had come in both illegally from Zimbabwe, because it's right on the Zimbabwe border, and from Mozambique, because again, this supplies a source of income. Okay. Uh, one of my collaborators, Marcelo Vega from the University of British Columbia, uh, went on to work with the miners in 2005, and he provided them with an educational program Okay, outline, outlining the appropriate use of how to use retorts to prevent mercury. Because when he went there, the miners were exposed to tremendous amounts of mercury. The ambient mercury concentration, which is again supposed to be less than five nanograms per cubic meter, okay, was sometimes in the thousands of nanograms per cubic meter. Okay. Mercury, uh, Munyena was a mercury intensive mine. Um, and this is one of the things that I would point out. Marcello went out and published papers on this, saying that this is what we did. We went out and we utilized retorts. We evaluated, we generated a baseline of information for how much mercury was used, okay? And this is the important thing. He outlined his educational activities. And when we went back in 2010, we followed up to see whether or not it worked. Because sometimes, you know, the best laid plans Things don't work out. And Marcelo hadn't been back in five years, so we went back out and we took a look at the amount of mercury. So when Marcelo went there, the camp averaged 400 nanograms per cubic meter of mercury, and the gold shops averaged 35,000 nanograms, I'm sorry, 35,000 micrograms per cubic meter of mercury. Um, there was a huge concentration of mercury in the miner's breath. Look at the burners, people that identified themselves as burners. Okay, 50 micrograms per cubic meter of mercury. This is almost acute toxicity of mercury. These people are very, very sick. Okay. Since Marcelo went there and brought with them business plans and brought with, uh, with him um, the knowledge of retorts, a lot's changed at Munyena. Munyena, the miners actually took over and started organizing themselves, and it's been split into two mines. Upper Munyena, which is industrialized, okay, there's some international investors that still only employ Mozambicans and Zimbabweans, and Lower Munyena, which is very similar to what happened in 2005 with only 125 miners. Think about that. From 5,000 miners down to 125 miners, okay, where did those people go? Well, they went to new gold mines. It's a very nomadic existence. One of the cool things that we were able to show is that Upper Munyena has completely incorporated retorts and has organized. What that means is they now have a burning schedule. They all use retorts, okay? There's only two burners who classify themselves as being the people that liberate the gold from the mercury, okay? And their breath values were below 250 nanograms per cubic meter. One of the things that I would put that out is that's four or five orders of magnitude less mercury in their breath, okay? We actually took a look at their retorts and used the, um, the, the Lumex to determine the amount of mercury, whether or not they were using the, these on normal basis. We couldn't get near their retorts. But the good news is, we couldn't get near, the, let me rephrase that, we couldn't get near their retorts because the concentration of mercury was so high we were afraid we were gonna break our instrument. But 10 feet away, mercury level, mercury concentrations were very, very normal, okay? the retorts worked, okay? They were able to adequately demonstrate the correct and safe use of retorts, and it was obvious that they worked, okay? You could see it from the miners, because many of those miners were there five, six years earlier, okay? And they knew about what happened with mercury poisoning, okay? There is a bit of a problem. Lower Munyena has improved, but Lower Munyena is the non-industrialized one. It has improved, but there have been issues, okay? Not everybody there uses retorts. The concentrations of mercury in the air are still high. One of the big problems is with the instability in Zimbabwe, they see a lot of new Zimbabwean miners who, who just come and basically set up shop. And what, what really happens is when you bring in people who haven't been educated uh, in how to use these retorts, you see a little bit of recidivism, okay? People start burning more frequently and all over the place. But one of the key things that Marcelo was able to stop is the miners have stopped using the river directly, okay? And this is a huge improvement because it used to be that all the mercury waste would go straight into the rivers. And mercury, elemental mercury that they're using isn't really soluble in water. 
okay? But it gets oxidized to inorganic mercury. Inorganic mercury gets chomped on by microbes, okay? And basically what happens is it gets converted into very, very highly toxic alkyl mercury species, okay? So getting them away from the river is a major step forward. One of the things that I would point out, retorts aren't a cure-all, okay? And lower Munyena, where they used to do the mining, soil samples have huge concentrations of mercury still, okay? We had to run, the, my colleagues, uh, we feel comfortable with 40 ppm mercury concentration. We have some samples that are above 400 ppm mercury. This is a tremendous amount of mercury in the, uh, in the soil, considering that if you travel a mile away, okay, upwind, okay, the, the, it's supposed to be 0 0.02 ppm, okay? There's long-term issues. The problem is, Unlike organic compounds that get oxidized, unlike organic compounds that are photoreactive and decompose, okay, metal sticks around. It doesn't go anywhere. Elemental mercury may be volatile, but as soon as it gets oxidized, okay, it's there unless you're going to go ahead with a shovel and pick it back up. Okay, as soon as it gets alkylated, it stays in the ecosystem. Okay? And again, one of the big problems that we're a little bit concerned about is it's in the soil now. It seems to be relatively contained for the time being, but every year they have a rainy season. The rivers flood, okay? That inorganic mercury is still going to be finding its way into the water system. One other thing that we would point out, post-retorts, Munyen in 2010, 2011, our students led brush-up educational se sessions. We, make our we don't make our students. We encourage our students, based on grades, to go ahead and bring posters, okay? And what you can see here, uh, this is Ben um, holding the poster, this is Katie leading the discussion. Unfortunately, I cropped it out, but there's about 50 miners there. And Katie is speaking in English, and this gentleman here translates it into Portuguese, which is the national language of Mozambique, okay? As well as Shona, which is the regional dial, which is the regional language, okay? So we were amazed at the number of new miners. Um, and the lack of understanding of the dangers of mercury, when new miners come in, okay, some of these people were teachers, some of these people were lawyers, some of these people were bankers from Zimbabwe. Okay, they have no source of income. They come in and they have very little understanding of how you know, mercury affects the world around them. Okay? So education works, but you can't stop educating. What we need to do is build capacity. And what I mean by that is we need to go in and train trainers. We need to go in and have a stabilized population and pick 10 guys and train them okay, on safe ways to use mercury, alternatives to using mercury, okay, and then have them train other Mozambicans. That's really important. Here's part of the issue. Munyena has really made some great strides forward, but only 15 kilometers away, which believe it or not is a two hour drive, okay? Setsera uses technology from thousands of years ago. They've not adopted retorts, okay? Why? It's because there's so little infrastructure in Mozambique that ideas don't move from mine to mine. And we really need to find a way to address that, okay? So at Setsera, which by the way, again, Setsera was this picture where I was showing you, okay? The exposure of children to mercury, okay, is between 400 and 800 nanograms per cubic meter of ambient mercury. And when you go to Setsera, you can see many of these small children here, okay, actually taking part in the mining activities, which includes taking their hands, and remember I was telling you guys about the panning process, which includes taking their hands and mixing the mercury in the soil, or I'm sorry, the mercury and in, in, in the, the ore by hand. Okay, that's not good. So we went and we did our same educational sessions, okay? This is remarkably high, okay? The soil is highly contaminated. They raise fish for eating in their pits. Instead of using the river, they're using pits now, but they raise fish for eating in there. Chickens all over the place that are used to produce eggs. There's a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of work that needs to be done there. And again, unlike the other mines, highly unreinforced mining shafts. You can't get the scale of this unless you're there. But this pit is about the size of this building. And in the middle of the pit, and you can't see it down here, that's me falling. Um, 
but you can't see it. There's basically a hole that's about five feet wide and it's about 70 to 80 feet deep. These sticks are not there for structural support. They're there for people to climb in and climb out. How do you fix this problem? Well, the key thing is to not give up. Okay? We, we're going to keep going back and we're going to keep telling them the appropriate ways to do it and hopefully Mozambique is going to be on the economic upswing and we're going to start seeing investing in these mines, providing people with stable incomes. Okay? But this is one of the most dangerous, you think I went down there? No. I made a student, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but um, you know, these are the sort of things, and everybody there is so nice. The people are so wonderful. Would you like to come down? Absolutely not, because if I get stuck, there's no cranes big enough in that country to get me back up. Again, so this is what I was saying. This is a gentleman burning amalgam, OK? He's blowing directly into the smoke. That smoke contains a ton of mercury. Okay, a lot of mercury, and he's breathing it right back in. Okay, this miner in particular, we took his readings with the Lumex beforehand, and he was blowing about 1,500 nanograms per cubic meter before burning. That is a tremendous amount of mercury to hold in your lungs. And then on top of that, after burning 60,000 nanograms per cubic meter, it is a tremendous source of exposure for these miners. The volatilized mercury is the number one problem. Okay, I'm going to close out the talk talking a little bit. How am I doing on time, by the way? I'm doing okay. Okay, I talk a lot. Um, I'm going to close out the, the the talk talking about one of the true miracles that happens. Um, Mozambique is exceptionally poor, but people take care of themselves. This guy, Crispin Elias Shabaya, um, invited us in to show us his mind. I've met a lot of bright people in my time. Okay, this guy is the smartest man I've ever met. And he didn't go much to school past, I think he said, fourth grade. He lost both his mother and his father. Um, and he became an artisanal gold miner um, about the age of nine or 10. And he's about maybe 45 now. Um, and he spent his entire life working. This is a guy that basically went into the jungle okay, with a couple friends and found an old mine, a source of gold. And what he did was he said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. I'm tired of people working for themselves. Okay? I'm tired of people just scraping by. Let's create a mine that works for us, the Mozambican people. And what he did was he took timber, and he and his friends basically started digging mine shafts. Everything is timber reinforced. This guy is not an engineer. You should see what this guy can do with the things that are, are I've never seen anything like it. Okay? In addition, he had seen so many people get sick from mercury that he spent years trying to develop a way to prevent mercury exposure. And what it came down to for a number of years was he was the only one in the mine allowed to use the mercury. That was the rule. Okay? He, you know, he basically would go and he was responsible for burning it. He took that upon himself. Then what he realized one day um, is that he put some of the crushed material next to a, a radio. And some of the, the material moved on the top. And he said, that's weird. And what he did was he took out his speaker magnet and he passed it over the top of the sample. Okay. And what happens is it just so happens where he's mining, the gang materials, G-A-N-G-U-E, the waste materials, are magnetic. And so what he can do is he can take and he can pan and remove all of the light stuff. The heavy stuff will settle to the bottom. And it just so happens the heavy stuff that's not gold is magnetic. And so he's, he, he owns a lot of speaker magnets and he passes them over the top numerous times, each time wiping off the magnetic material. By the way, you think that this is the kind of guy that just throws out the magnetic material? No. He knows that there's more gold to be got. Okay? He separates everything out. You should see the amount of magnetized particles okay, that, that, that he has off to the side. Because when cyanidation, which is another form of extracting gold, when cyanidation comes to Mozambique, this guy is going to be loaded. Okay? He's smart. What he's been able to do by eliminating the use of mercury, by running a good business, is he pays his miners a salary. Okay? Constant employment. 
365 days a year. When gold's tough to come by, when they've hit a dry spot, he's got another company that takes some of the materials that would typically go down the water, they make bricks out of them. He's got his own brick making company. On top of that, remember, what happens? So mining is not a sustainable industry, okay? It's not. Once you take it out of the earth, it's not gonna regrow. No amount of water and fertilizer regrows rock, okay? Especially, however, he had to remove a lot of trees on the property, okay, in order to timber reinforce that. So what he did was he had this idea that he didn't want to pay somebody else, okay, to buy trees from them. So he started a nursery. And if you drive through his property, this guy's got 10 years worth of trees. Now he, and he grows what, they, what he calls gum trees. They grow really quickly. And basically he's been able to hire foresters to go around on his property and maintain gardens. He's got little seedlings all over the place. This is a guy who knows how to get stuff done. This is a guy with no formal education who has done more for his, the people around him than anybody I've ever met, okay? Um, one of the things that I would say, if you're interested in hearing his story, we, we do have uh, an hour-long video of him being interviewed by our students. Almost everybody we met in Mozambique, we tried to interview. This guy's got a phenomenal story. And if you're interested, contact me and I can supply you uh, with, with that video footage. Um, oh, and one other thing that I'd point out, this is a guy that also kind of thinks differently. Um, he provides breakfast and lunch for all of his miners. All of his miners' kids go to school. Okay, they're rewarded by him for good grades. Okay, he won't let his kids go into mining. Okay? <laughs> He's, he's made enough money that he's sending them to school so that they don't have to suffer the way that he did. His words, not mine. Okay? Um, and one of the other really cool things, he provides them with uniforms and hard hats in a country where uniforms and hard hats, many people only have their clothes on their back. Um, yeah, I mean, just an absolutely remarkable guy. Started a soccer league for his coworkers. I mean, just keep, keeping them on the straight and narrow. And again, last thing that I point out, um, you'll see here, Kevin is uh, one of my colleagues. That's me. This is Marcelo, uh, one of our collaborators from British Columbia. And then undergraduate student, undergraduate student, undergraduate student, all the way down. And Laurelyn Reddy and uh, James Chijel are uh, our collaborators at Ole Miss who help us run some of the samples. So again, what we've been able to do is write up our experiences uh, with uh, the clean tech mining. They want us to build a school, and they want data, okay? This is how the Mozambican government has started coming around to it. Um, right now, uh, we're at the stage where we're gonna be moving on to Ecuador. To, we've been asked to build ITCAM, the International Training Center for Artisanal Gold Miners, along with our collaborators from uh, around the world, um, hoping to come up with a school where we can invite miners from around the world to come and learn about the dangers of mercury and new and environmentally benign ways of mining. Um, Student experience, I'll throw in a couple slides at the end. Uh, this was one of our two vehicles, a lot of flat tires. Um, this is a typical road that we would be on. Um, we collaborated, we were lucky enough to collaborate with a local university, Universidad Eduardo Manlan, based out of Maputo. Um, and they were able to send two students uh, with us this last time and two students the year before to collaborate with us. Um, and realistically, what this is about is, you know, none of these kids are going into mining. It's about having them tell their friends and their families about problems from around the world. You know, it's about telling the story. That's 90% of why we even bother to publish this stuff. It's telling the story so people know what other people are doing. Okay? And again, what we've offered is the analysis of soil, water, air, some biological samples, um, and chemical and biological expertise. Uh, and then two new questions that are being asked. Um, what happens with the organomercury species in the environment? Um, and one big thing that we've noticed, a lot of the bacteria that grows in these camps, um, and I'm not a biologist, but a, a, number, a lot of the bacteria that grows in these camps are actually mercury resistant. And that's on the same uh, plasmid as uh, the gene for antibiotic resistance. So we've grown some of the bacteria in these places, and basically we're forcing evolution's hand here. We're giving these bacteria mercury, and they're becoming antibiotic resistant. 
Okay, and this is one of the things that my colleague Kevin Drace is really concentrating on. And this is, this is scary. This is, this is one of these things, antibiotic resistant uh, infections are a big problem in this country. Imagine what it would be like in a mining camp. Imagine what it would be like with other bacterial infections. Okay, this is what we call an unforeseen dilemma. I think we're the only people that have really noticed this problem. Um, and we're working on it. We also had some fun. The people were amazing, okay? It is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, probably the most beautiful place that I've ever been, okay? But we didn't have too much fun because you have warthogs, various hooved mammals, crocodiles, and baboons. Baboons, you'd think they'd be friendly. They're really not, okay? Words to live by. Um, and then finally, the acknowledgments, and I've listed all the student collaborators that I've had. Um, we're in the process now of starting to write up the material. But Dr. Kevin Drace, none of this, he's kind of, uh, we joke, we call him my better half. Um, he, he's, he's got the logistical know-how. He and I work very well together. Uh, Mercer on Mission has funded us, the Universidad of Eduardo Monlan. And then again, Jim Chigel at Ole Miss has a phenomenal research group and does phenomenal work detecting mercury in the environment. And he's been nice enough to run samples for us and collaborate to figure out where, where the mercury is. That's all I got.